Dawn and fog still shrouded the world. In the sleepy village of South Shore, people stirred, unable to see the light, but knowing night had ended nonetheless. The fog covered the world, draping itself over their simple wooden homes and concealing the sea they knew lay just beyond the town's edge. Though they could not see it, they could hear the water lapping at the shore, rippling up and around the single dock. They soon began to hear something else. Slow and steady it came, floating through the fog, the sound reverberating until they could identify neither source nor direction. Did it come from the land behind them or the sea before them? Was it merely the waves striking harder than usual or rain beating down upon the fog itself? Or some trader's wagon rolling along the hard dirt path? Listening intently, the villagers finally realized the strange new sound came from the water. Rushing to the shore, they peered out into the fog, trying to pierce its gloom. What was this noise and what did it bring with it? Slowly, the fog began to shift as if pushed forward by the noise itself. The fog swelled and darkened, and then the darkness took on form, a wave rushing towards them. The villagers backed away, several of them crying out. They were masters of the water, these men, fishermen born and bred, but this wave was not water. It moved wrong for that, it was something else. The darkness continued its approach, carrying the fog, the fog with it, the sound intensifying. Then finally it breached the fog, piercing its veil, and the shape divided into many and took on form. Boats, many boats. The villagers relaxed slightly, for boats they understood, yet still they were wary. South Shore was a quiet fishing village. They had dozens of small bo boats themselves, no more, and had seen perhaps a dozen, dozen others through the years. Suddenly, there were hundreds approaching them all at once. What did this mean? The men grasped short wooden clubs, knived, knives, hooked poles, and weighted nets, whatever came to hand, and they waited tensely, watching as the boats drew closer. More boats were emerging from the mist, an unending procession, and with each new row of ships, the villagers' shock grew. There were not hundreds, but thousands approaching them, a veritable nation, more boats than they had ever seen before. Where had so many vessels come from? What could make them put to the water at once like this? And what could send them to Lord Daron? The villagers gripped their weapons more tightly, children and women hiding within their homes, and still the boats multiplied. The sounds were finally clear as the stroke of many oars striking the water out of rhythm. The first boat beached itself, and only now could the villagers see the figures within it. They relaxed further, though their confusion and concern grew. There were men there, and women, and even children judging by the size, with skin both pale and tanned, and hair all the normal shades. These were not monsters, nor the other races the villagers had heard of but never seen. Nor did they seem to arm for battle. But clearly most of these newcomers were not warriors. This was no invasion at least. It seemed more a flight from some horrible disaster, and the villagers felt their fear turning to sympathy. What could have sent them? What could have sent what seemed an entire nation into the sea? More boats reached the shore, and people began to stagger out of them. Some collapsed on the rocky beach crying. Others stood tall and took deep breaths as if glad to be rid of the water. The fog was rolling back now, the morning sun beating it to thin, thin wisps that faded for the strong rays, and the villagers could see more clearly. These people were no army. Many of them were women and children, indeed, and many were poorly dressed. They looked thin and weak. They were just people, people clearly stricken by some calamity many of them so overwrought they could barely stand or stumble up the shore. A few wore armor, however. One from the lead boat walked toward the assembled villagers. He was a large, stout man, almost bald, with a thick mustache and a beard and a strong, stern face. His armor had clearly seen many battles, 
and above one shoulder rose the hilt of a massive sword. But in his arms he carried not weapons but two small children, and several more hurried alongside him, clinging to the warrior's armor, belt, and scabbard. Beside him walked a strange man, tall and broad-shouldered, but slendered, white-haired, but with a strong stride. This one was dressed all in tattered violet robes and a worn rucksack, and carried a child across one shoulder while leading another by the hand. A third figure moved with them, a youth, brown-haired and brown-eyed and barely, and barely aware of his surroundings, one hand holding the large man's cloak like a child clinging desperately to a parent's hand. His clothes were richly made, but stiff with sea salt and worn from hard use. Hail and well met, the warriors called out, approaching the villagers, his broad face grim. We are refugees, fleeing a terrible, terrible battle. I beg you, any food and drink you might spare, and shelter if you can, for the children's sake. The villagers glanced at one another, then nodded, weapons lowering. They were not a wealthy village, but they were not poor either, and they would have to be far worse off to let children go unaided. Men came and took the children from the warrior and the violet-robed one and led them to the church, their largest, sturdiest structure. Already the village women were stirring up pots of porridge and stew. Soon the refugees were camped in the church and around it, eating and drinking, sharing donated blankets and coats. The mood would have been festive if not for the sorrow evident on every newcomer's face. Thank you, the warrior told the village headman, who had introduced himself as Marcus Redpath. I know you cannot spare much, and I am grateful for what you have given us. We will not let women and children suffer, Marcus replied. He frowned, studying the other man's armor and sword. Now tell me, who are you and why are you here? My name is Anduin Lothar, the warrior answered running a hand over his forehead. I am, I was, the knight champion of Stormwind. Stormwind? Marcus had heard of the nation, but that is across the sea. Yes, Lothar nodded sadly. We sailed for days to reach this land. We are in Lordaeron, are we not? We are, the violet-robed one commented, speaking for the first time. I recognize the land, though not this village. His voice was surprisingly strong for one so old, though up close only his hair and the lines on his face su suggested advanced age. Otherwise, he seemed barely more than a youth. This is South, South Shore, Marcus told them, eyeing the white-bearded young man warily. You are from Dalaran? He asked at last, trying to keep his tone neutral. I, the stranger acknowledged, and do not fear, I will be returning there as soon as my companions can travel. Marcus tried not to let his relief show. The wizards of Dalaran were powerful, and he had heard the king treated them as allies and advisors. But for himself, Marcus wanted no truck with magic or its wielders. We must not delay, Lothar was agreeing. I must speak with the king at once. We dare not give the horde time to move again. Marcus did not understand this comment, but he recognized the urgency in the stocky warrior's tone. The women and children may stay here a time, he assured them. We will care for them. Thank you, Lothar said with obvious sincerity. We will send food and other supplies back once we reach the king. It will take you time to reach capital city, Marcus pointed out. I will send someone ahead on a fast horse to warn them of your approach. What would you have them say? Lothar frowned. Tell the king that Stormwind has fallen, he said softly after a moment's pause. The prince is here, as are many of its people as I saved. We will need supplies and quickly, and we bring him grave and urgent news. Marcus's eyes had widened at the list of troubles, and his gaze had gone quickly to the youth standing beside the big warrior, then moved away before his stare could become rude. It will be done, he assured them, and turned away to speak to one of the villagers, who nodded and leaped onto a near nearby horse, galloping away before the headman had taken two steps back to the church. 
Willem is our finest rider, and his horse the fastest in the village, Marcus assured the two men. He will reach Capital City well ahead of you and deliver your message. We will gather horses and what food we can for you and your companions to take on your own journey. Lothar nodded. Thank you. He turned to the red he turned to the violet robed man. Gather those who would come with us, Cadgar, and make ready. We leave as soon as possible. The wizard nodded and turned away, heading for the nearest cluster of refugees. A few short hours later, Lothar and Cadgar left South Shore. The prince Varian Wyrin beside them, leading three score men. Most had chosen to remain behind, either from illness or fatigue, or simply out of fear and shock, and a desire to cling to those few survivors from their own land. Lothar did not begrudge them. A part of him wished he could remain in the small fishing village as well, but he had a duty to perform, as always. How far to capital city, he asked Khadgar, riding beside him. The villagers had offered them the use of what few mounts and carts they had, which had proven just enough to manage. Lothar had hesitated about taking any more from the generous villagers, but finally accepted knowing it would speed their process immeasurably, and time was of the essence. A few days, perhaps a week, the wizard replied. I don't know this part of the country that well, but I remember it on the maps. We should see the city spires in five days at the most. Then we will have to pass through Silver Pine Forest, one of the great wonders of Lord Daron, to skirt Lordamere Lake. The city stands along its north shore. Cadgar fell silent again, and Lothar studied his companion. He worried about the young man. When they'd first met, he'd been impressed by the wizard's composure and easy self-confidence, and astonished at his youth. He had been only seventeen, little more than a boy, and already a wizard in his own right, and the first Medivh had ever deigned to accept as an apprentice. Subsequent encounters had showed him that Cadgar was bright, stubborn, focused, and friendly. He'd found himself liking the boy, the first time that he'd felt such a friendship towards a wizard since, well, since Medivh himself. But after the events at Karazhan, Lothar shuddered, remembering the ugly, nightmarish conflict. He'd found himself with Cadgar, the half-orc Corona, and a handful of men against Medivh himself. Cadgar had administered a lethal blow to his master out of necessity, but it had been Lothar who had removed his old friend's head, a head he had protected many times in their youth, back when he and Medivh and Lane had been friends and companions. Lothar shook his head to drive away the tears. He had grieved many times on their long sea voyage, but it still felt as if the pain and rage in his sorrow would overwhelm him. Lane! His best friend, his companion, his king. Lane with the bright smile and the laughing eyes and the quick wit. Lane who had carried Stormwind into a golden age, only to see it torn apart by the orcs, their hordes sweeping across the land and destroying everything in their path. And then to discover that Medivh had been responsible for it all, that his magic had aided the orcs in reaching this world, had given them, given them access to Stormwind and thus had led to not only the kingdom's destruction, but Lane's death. Lothar bit back a cry at the thought of all he had lost, all his people had lost. Then he hearted himself to it, as he had so many times during their journey. He could not let himself succumb to such emotion. His people needed him, and so did the people of his land, of this land, though they did not know it yet. And so did Cadgar. Lothar still did not understand everything that had happened in Karazhan that night. Perhaps he never would. But somehow during the battle with Medivh, Khadgar had changed. His youth had been stripped away and his body aged unnaturally. Now he appeared an old man, far older than Lothar himself, though Khadgar was the younger of them by almost four decades. And he worried what else it had done to the young wizard. Khadgar, for his part, was too lost in his own thoughts to notice his companion's concerned gaze. 
The young old wizard's thoughts were turned inward, though they ran along the same lines as his companions. He was re reliving the battle in Karazan and experiencing again that horrible, wrenching sensation as Medivh drew from him his magic and his youth. The magic had returned, indeed, in many ways. It was far stronger now than before, but his youth was gone, torn from him long before its time. He was an old man now, at least in appearance. He still felt hale and hearty, and had as much endurance and strength and agility as ever. But his face was lined, his eyes deep set, and his hair and fledgling beard a stark white. Though only nineteen, Cadgar knew he looked three times that and more. He looked like the man in his vision, the older version of himself he had seen in battle through the magic of Medivh's tower. The older man who would someday die beneath a strange red sun, far from home. Cadgar also studied the emotions within him, the ones that came from Medivh's death. The man had been evil incarnate, single-handedly responsible for loosing the orc horde upon the world. Yet it had not been the man, not truly, for Medivh had been subsumed by the titan Sargeras, who his mother had defeated millennia before. Sargeras had not died, only his body, and he had hidden away within Agwin's womb, infesting her unborn son. Medivh had not been responsible for his own actions, and his dying words to Cadgar had revealed that the mages had been fighting the evil within, within himself for years, perhaps all his life. Cadgar had even encountered a strange phantom version of his dead master shortly after burying the body, and that Medivh had claimed to be from the future and to be free of Sargeras' taint at last, thanks to Cadgar himself. So what should he feel, Cadgar wondered. Should he be sad that his master had died? At times he had liked Medivh a great deal, and certainly the world had lost much when the mages died. Should he be proud of the role he had played in freeing the man and driving Sargeras from this world again, perhaps for good? Should he be enraged that what Medivh had done, at what Medivh had done, both to him and to others? or awed that one man could resist the influence of a titan for so long. He could not tell. Cadgar's mind was a whirl, as was his heart, and added to all the thoughts of Medivh were more. For he was home, at least he was back in his homeland, back in Lordaeron, and not in the way he had expected. When he had left to become Medivh's apprentice, the behest of his previous masters in Dalaran, Cadgar had not expected to return until, until he was a master mage himself. He had thought to fly back on a griffin, as Medivh had taught him, and land atop the Violet Citadel so that all his former teachers and fellows could marvel at his prowess. Instead, he was riding a plow horse beside Stormwind's former champion, leading a ragtag band of men to speak to the king about saving the world. Cadgar bit back a chuckle. Well, at least they would make a dramatic entrance, he thought. That was something his old teachers and friends would appreciate. What will we do once we reach the city, he asked Lothar, startling the aging warrior for some reverie, from some reverie. His companion recovered quickly, however, turning to study him with those disarming storm blue eyes that showed the warrior's emotions plainly, but hid the sharp mind within. We will speak with the king, Lothar replied simply. He glanced at the youth riding silently beside them, and reached back to stroke the handle of his great sword, its gems and gold gleaming in the afternoon sunlight. Though Stormwind is lost, Varian is still her prince, and I am still her champion. I've only met King Tyrannus briefly and many years ago, but perhaps he'll recognize me. Certainly he will know Varian and the messenger will make sure he is aware of our arrival. He will grant us an audience, and then we shall tell him what has happened and what must be done. And what must we do, Cadgar asked, though he already knew. We must gather the rulers of this land, Lothar answered, as Cadgar thought he might. 
We must force them to see the danger. No nation can stand alone, not against the horde. My own land tried and is gone because of it. We must not let that happen here. The people must unite and fight. His hands clenched on the horse's reins, and Khadgar could again see the powerful warrior who had led Stormwind's armies and kept its borders safe for so many years. Let us hope they listen, Khadgar said softly, for all our sakes. They will, Lothar assured him, they must. Neither of them said, the, said what they were both thinking. They had seen the power of the Horde firsthand. If the nations did not unite, if their rulers refused to see the danger, they would fall. And the Horde would sweep across this land as it had across Stormwind, leaving nothing behind. 